If you have been born again, you have been given a new mind, a new way of thinking, a new way of living, a new nature. And it's very, very important that we know how to distinguish the difference between the mind of God, which is the mind of Christ, and the mind of the flesh, which is the mind of Satan. There is no third mind. You either wear the helmet of salvation or the helmet of the flesh. You do not have, a, you're not an existing deity, right? Separate from what masters you. And we know this about uh, the constant teaching that God has us walk through here at this church. There are two masters, not three. Amen? Amen. There's two. There's the devil and there's God. Now, here's the truth. In those two masters, there's one ultimate master, and that's God. So the devil doesn't have free reign to do whatever he wants. Even whatever permission God has given him is still under God's rule. And he has an appointed time where he's going to face judgment. Amen? God is the only one that doesn't have to face consequences of anything because he's God. And now through Christ, God has given you his own mind. Now, did I say you're God? No. Say that loud. No. Everyone online needs to make sure, right? No, I'm not saying you're God, and no, I'm not saying you're many gods. So let's just get that out of the way. What I am saying is that you are like Jesus. You are, you are becoming formed into his image, meaning you're, you're starting to know what he desires and what he wants and what he thinks. You're, you're not him, but you become like him. Make that real clear. Amen? So you have the authority he's given you. You don't have his authority. Say amen. amen. Okay. So we're going to talk about the mind of Christ. And I really feel that this is, a, this is a, like many of the teachings, this is a teaching that uh, doesn't get taught enough. I think people are, are honestly have probably mistaught it or, or, or misguided people into thinking um, that they have a freedom separate from Christ. Do you, in Jesus, do you have a freedom separate from Jesus? Okay, let me give it another way. Like, just a natural, natural, natural example. If me and Michelle are married, and we're in the marriage, do I have the freedom to do whatever I want? Or does the marriage put standards on me to keep me loyal? Now, a proud person... And a person in the mind of the flesh or the helmet of the flesh would say, I could do whatever I want. I don't have to stay in the marriage. If you think that way, you're already gone. That's not the mind of Christ. I'm helping you right now. That's not the mind of Christ. That's the mind of the flesh that uses human reasoning in order to say, I have the free will to do whatever I want. The first commandment in the satanic Bible is do as thou wilt. Do whatever you want to do. So whenever anyone preaches from the realm that you could just walk away from God, no, you can't. You're going to answer to him one day. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that's not what I mean. Right now, while I'm in this flesh, I can choose to do this or that. Listen to the wisdom of God. If you're already thinking that way, your flesh dominates you. Because if you're in the spirit of God, the spirit of God does not talk that way. The spirit of God does not pump up the ego of man. The Spirit of God does not tell a person, hey, you know, this whole thing really depends on you. The Spirit of God does not say that. The Spirit of God says this whole thing depends on the Lord. So if you don't agree with that, you're already agreeing with the other mindset. Anything that doesn't agree with Christ is agreeing with the devil. And I know that's hard to hear. That's hard to hear because we're in ourselves, right? We, we, every day we're making decisions and just harmless decisions, right? I pick up the bottle, I set it down, and we want to equate that to doing good works or not. You see what I'm saying? But the depth of that is God gives me the hand to grab and the strength to lift. It's God who supplies all that I need that I might do. And even if I take in the water, it's God that's created me to receive it so I could be hydrated. I'm not the one in control of the outcome of these things. God is. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Do you know that there, there, there's people who are allergic to water? 
serious. You know, there's people allergic to the sun. Like there, there's a young lady. I saw a, a, a documentary about her that she drinks water. She she it, um she has an allergic reaction to it, and it could actually kill her to drink it. So they have to do it a special way where they they infuse to make her body needs water, right? But they have to do it without her drinking it. Yeah, they have to put it into her body. I guess so. I would I would assume an IV. I mean, I don't know how else would they do it through the ear. I, I love you, bro. What I'm saying though is is why not you? What do you tell that girl? That's allergic to what's supposed to be naturally helping her. It's that God made her that way. God created her in their mother's womb. He knew the allergies that would be in her body and he knows why those things happen. Somebody help me. You know, a lot of times people have an issue with sin being passed down to them. Like a generational curse. Jamil, right? People have issues with generational curses. Like, don't tell me I'm like my dad, but you're just like him, right? You get older, you're like, oh my God, I sound like him. I walk like him. But don't tell me that I've inherited anything. People have an issue with that. Your idea of sin, your idea of free will, your idea of what masters you comes from an idea. It's not your own. You didn't formulate it by yourself. You inherited sin, church, from Adam and Eve. The entire world is born into sin because of one man's disobedience. Amen. And no one in that fallen state saves themselves. It's through one man's obedience that we're brought into right standing with God. And that's through Jesus Christ. So we see why did Adam sin? Because Eve was deceived by the serpent. And so the serpent now becomes the master of the fallen state. So, which we all once were. But when you're born again, you're now a slave of Christ. You're now free from the slavery of the flesh and you're walking in the spirit. And this is the reality of what we're going to talk about today. The mind of Christ. Go real quick to Proverbs 15. Father, I pray that as I preach your word today, that the anointing would fall on all of us, that we would not walk in confusion. As a matter of fact, I pray that if confusion is necessary for the sake of freedom, then allow it to happen, yes, Lord. Lord. I pray if people have questions and doubts and fears, that at some point they realize that those questions, doubts, and fears are coming from the lack of human reasoning understanding and that you need to bring them into understanding in the spirit. Father, I pray for your anointing to fall on all of us so we could be free in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Proverbs 15, 11. And I almost did it again, Michelle. I almost read out of Psalms 15. See? I think I'm going to be an old man doing that. I, I can't get away from it. You ready? Even death and destruction hold no secrets from the Lord. How much more does he know the human heart? Even death and destruction holds no secrets from the Lord. He, it means he knows everything about it. He knows the very, the, the, the very cause, the, the intent behind what brings death and destruction. He says, how much more does God know the human heart? If you're saved, raise your hand. Amen. Now, now real quick, in your salvation, look how many people are saved in here. Praise God. That was everybody. In your salvation, if God is not revealing to you your heart, it's not salvation. The work of salvation shows you what manner of person you really are without God. If that is not happening, if it's, well, God says this, the devil says this, and I say this, you're not in salvation. That's not the work of salvation. That's a counterfeit faith. No, it's God says this, and that's where I'm putting all my trust. There is no separating my thoughts from God's thoughts. Ooh, glory to God. There's no separating my thoughts from the devil's thoughts. If I'm having evil thoughts, that's because I have a flesh that's the conduit of Satan. If I'm having godly thoughts, that's because I have a spirit that's the conduit of Christ. 
I don't take any of the glory for the good and I take no shame for the bad because I don't exist separate from either of those. Yeah, say praise God. That's, that, that's good truth. That brings peace to you because it makes it clear like what belongs to God and what doesn't. Go real quick to 1 Corinthians 2. We're going to scour through a little scripture here. If you're in the flesh, I'm telling you, what does it mean to be in the flesh? It's, it's you're under the power of human reason. What does that mean? That means you're trying to understand God with your human mind. What does that mean? That means your human mind has standards in which you're trying to make God come down to. Do you see the deception in that? Your human mind has standards that you're trying to make God come down to, but you've convinced yourself you're trying to make him live up to it. But really, you're trying to bring him down to the human standard because God's standard is way above human standards. It's true. So, so I'll give you an example of what you battle in human reason. You'll say something like, well, God doesn't want me sick. Then why are you sick? Why are you sick? We struggle, but here's the reasoning, because we think want is the same as intent. We have a lack of understanding as human beings. In our disposition of the flesh, we naturally question God. We don't get the answers. We, we got questions. But we automatically, because we go, well, God doesn't want me sick. No, God's intent is not for, it's for no one to perish. There's no greater sickness than perishing. Amen? So God, it's God's intent. Of course, God doesn't, want, doesn't intend for you to get cancer. He doesn't want you to suffer out of intent. But God is wise and all-knowing. And he knows the human heart. And he knows how to keep people humble. And if sickness is the only way to do it, he's going to strike you with sickness because he cares more about your soul than he does your body. He cares more about your soul than he does your body. He cares more about your spiritual nourishment than your physical nourishment. And God is the only one that knows how to cause you to go through physical pain that you might experience spiritual well-being. May God grant us wisdom this morning to receive that truth. God knows how to inflict me to set me free. And I will not question Almighty God. If he says it's meant for me to be sick with cancer, that I might stand before you as a pastor who dies his dying breath through cancer, but I give God all the glory, Amen. so be it. Amen. Somebody would say in reasoning, oh, brother, don't wish that on yourself. I'm not wishing anything on myself that isn't the will of God. If God wills it, I accept it. Can you do that with your life right now? The mind of Christ says yes. The mind of the flesh says, oh, Lord, no. Can I be completely transparent? Without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, all I'm left with is fear. All I have is don't let that happen to me, Lord. But because I'm empowered, I'm filled with the Lord, I can say whatever your will is, let it be done. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in 13. Well, we tell you these things. When we tell you these things, we do not use... Ah, Lord, help me preach. Help me preach, Lord. Help, the, help us here. Help us here. When we tell you these things, we do not use words that come from human wisdom. When we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, we do not use words that come from human wisdom. I'm not just telling you how God's going to make your temporary life better. Amen. I'm telling you how God's going to help you endure this temporary life for better or for worse. The mind of Christ is different than the mind of the flesh. Look what he says. Instead, we, just say we. Okay, so you're not going to leave me by myself, right? Like I want to be able to say this about our, our congregation and our family. When I talk to people, when I talk to other pastors, preachers, ministers, other people who are believers, I want to be able to say, we. I don't want to be divided in how we're operating in the Lord. I want to be united in our operation in the Lord. 
I want to be so confident. I go, you know, if you go talk to Will, he's going to give you Christ. He's going to give you the Lord. Why? Because I can see the work of the Lord in him. We, not I. We. Say we. 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 You want this. You yeah. want this. Watch this. He yeah. says, we speak words given to us by what? The Spirit, the Spirit of God. Using the Spirit's words to explain spiritual truths. But people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's Spirit. It all sounds foolish to them, and they can't understand it, for only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit means. Those who are spiritual can evaluate all things, but they themselves cannot be evaluated by others. Your own flesh cannot evaluate the Spirit of God in you. And you, you ever, okay, let me give you a case in point before I finish this next part. You ever been in a conversation with yourself? God clearly spoke to you, and you know that it was God. You know it's God because it's going to cost you everything? You know it's God because it gives him all the glory? Amen? You know it's God. Like, God's telling you, give that up. God's telling you, don't do that or do this. And you know it's God because it costs you everything, and it gives him all the glory. You know, and I'm not talking about that weird, like when people try to do that in the name of the Lord, but they're manipulating because they really want their own way, but they're masking it as a Christian. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a genuine person who loves God, wants to please God, is giving up their life for God, knows this is going to cost me everything because the gospel has to go forward and it gives God all the glory. This, this is going to hurt. And then God gives you this word. This is what I want you to do, whether that's attend this church, preach this over here, whatever it is, God's telling you do something for him. And then you got this other voice. You ever have that where you had a couple voices going on inside of you? Yeah. Oh, I'm the only one? No. no, I'm the one that's bipolar, right? You guys got it all figured out. <laughs> the Lord says something, and then you don't want to do it. You don't want to do it. You're like, I don't know if that's God. <laughs> have you ever done that? Yeah. A part of you is like, this is totally God. And the other part's like, I don't know if that's God. <laughs> Which one is the flesh? The one that says, oh, I think this is God. No, your flesh will never acknowledge it's God, ever. Your flesh will always fight against it. Now, I, I'm going to give you some spiritual understanding. Hopefully, you, can, you don't overthink this. But because your flesh is that way, guess who else's flesh is that way? The person next to you. And guess what the entire world's disposition is without God? The same way. This is why <laughs> you're not going to like this. You're not going to like this. Even after today's message, you're going to be tested. Because the entire world is against God. So your car is against God. You, you're like, oh my God, I can't, how can you say such a thing? Because, it, listen, your car doesn't last forever. It's deteriorating. Because of that, because of sin, your car cannot last forever. Because of sin, your car rusts. So help me, Amen. church. Because of sin, your battery dies. Amen. You understand? Like if there was no sin, your battery, you would never need another battery. Matter of fact, your car wouldn't even run on these elements just on the glory of God. Amen. I'm just saying, you think I'm crazy, but it's true. Everything is held together by God. God is the one that holds everything together. So your car is a sinful car <laughs> because it's in death and decay. The entire world is in death and decay. So so listen, this is why when, you, when God tells you, give up your car, someone wants to give you a better one all of a sudden. All of a sudden, you're like, okay, I'm going to give up everything. And someone's like, hey, man, I want to give you this $300,000, whatever, right? And you're like, what the heck, man? Hold on. And, you're, and this is what happens. Wait, God was t dealing with my heart, telling me I need to detach from the love of these things. And now the temptation's coming saying, whoa, he really wanted to give me an upgrade. No, God's dealing with the human heart. God's dealing with the human heart. You know, you have to go through the same things Jesus went through. You don't get to skip anything. Jesus was tempted to bow to Satan so that he could get the whole world. You have a human flesh that is against God. This is why even when you start to obey God, now you get a flat tire. All of a sudden, someone calls with the distress. All of a sudden, the world's going chaotic because what do people do whenever good things start coming? They cause problems. I'm just talking about natural things. 
You have somebody in, the, in your life that's bitter and they start seeing you come up. What do they do? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Look at what they're doing. Oh, my God. <laughs> Throwing banana pills, hoping you slip on them. You know, right? That is the flesh, guys. That's the entire world. Oh, God's working in their life? Let's throw the whole kitchen sink at them right now. Now they're going to stand in line. The customer service is going to go bad. I mean, they're going to do everything right, and everything's going to go wrong. Am I the only one that's experienced this? No, no, let's be real. What's, you know what I hear more than anything? 25 years of Christianity, 25 years walking with the Lord. You know what I hear more than anything? People say, you know, when I came to God, my life got worse. <laughs> more than anything. When I came to God, it was supposed to get better, but then everything fell apart. Yeah, because there's a real flesh that's against God. He says this, 15, those who are spiritual can evaluate all things, but they themselves cannot be evaluated by others. For who can know the thoughts of the Lord and who knows enough to teach him? But we understand these things for we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. There is no separation of that. So go to Luke 6. And you know, a lot of times people, uh, I've, I've had these conversations with people who are leaders and stuff. And they're like, you got to be real careful with, with how you preach that because there's people who are going to just start putting God's name on everything. You know what I say? Praise God. Because then we can distinguish truth from lie. Yes. I don't want people operating in secrecy. Those are the, that's the hardest thing to deal with is when people say one thing, but then they're doing another. But if someone's out in front of you and they're totally missing the mark and like, I know this is God. He told me to buy this car and get $30,000 in debt. You're like, eh. God told you to get $30,000 in debt? Okay, let's, let's see where the gospel's going with that. Because you're not going to just put God's name on it because you want a new car. I'm not afraid of people doing that. They're going to have to deal with whatever comes with that anyways. Right? And by God's mercy, he knows how to help work through that so that they don't keep doing that. But you know what I am looking forward to? Are the people who actually get it. The ones who actually hear the voice of the Lord. The ones who actually start walking in freedom. That's why we preach it, because it has to be preached. Amen. Otherwise, what are we doing? I don't want to just sit here and give you a motivational speech. I want you thriving in the spirit. I want you walking in the spirit. I want you close to God, understanding the difference between the voice of the Lord and the voice of the devil. I want you knowing where to put all the glory and where to put all the shame. I want you chainless. Yes. Yes. Amen. Look at Luke 6, verse 6. Watch this. The mind of Christ, right? Do we have the mind of Christ? Yes, we do. All right, let's relate to this. Luke 6, verse 6. On another Sabbath day, a man with a deformed right hand was in the synagogue while Jesus was teaching. The teachers of religious law and the Pharisees watched Jesus closely. Now, before we go further, whenever you are in the flesh or in the mind of the flesh, you don't watch the same way as you do when you're in the spirit. When you're in the flesh, you're looking at Jesus waiting to see what's going to happen so you can decide if you're going to get with it or not. When you're in the spirit, you're like, regardless of what happens, I'm with you. You're already loyal to the Lord. You see, regardless of what man thinks about it, you're loyal to the Lord. Your heart and your disposition isn't, isn't trying to find him in a trap, trying to catch him in a trap. You're not trying to prove him wrong. You stand with him regardless if people try to prove him wrong. Amen. Because that's what the Spirit does. The Spirit unites with Jesus. It doesn't unite with man. So when you see them say this, you see the Scriptures say that they looked at him. You already know what the teachers of religious law were looking at him for. They were trying to find something wrong. Have you ever done that? Have you ever gone into a conversation and you're so bitter and you're so frustrated that you're not looking for what's right, you're just looking for what's wrong? You wanted to prove the other person wrong. I know I'm probably stirring up trouble in relationships right now. <laughs> just like, don't look to the left of you, right of you, right? But, you, but you're just like, see, that's what I'm talking about. And instead of hearing what's true, they were like that with Jesus, verse 7. The teachers of religious law and the Pharisees watched Jesus closely. If he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. I'll tell you right now, and this is wisdom, what God is allowing me to preach to you, the flesh will always put the emphasis on work. It will always measure a person by their good deeds or their bad deeds. 
The flesh doesn't know how to measure people by grace. It, it is by the grace of God we live, breathe, and do. It is not by a requirement of the law being met by you. It's by the grace of God. We know this is basic Christianity. But the flesh will always put the emphasis on what you're doing or you're not doing. If he heals the man on the Sabbath, we're going to just right there. He's working on the Sabbath. See, he broke the law. You know what else was in their heart, but you don't read it here, but it was definitely in their heart. And I can say it because I understand the human heart because God has given me his spirit. I know this even about myself. And if he doesn't heal the man, we're going to condemn him right there for not being loving. Either way this goes, we're condemning him. Can't win for losing. Mike and Des, y'all been in arguments like that? Huh? Didn't matter what he said, he was wrong. Didn't matter what she said, she was wrong. And maybe you, maybe she was right all the time. <laughs> like she's right all the time. <laughs> we can laugh about that because we know there's truth to that, right? But, but you know what I mean? That you're so upset that even if he's like, I'm sorry, it's not enough. If he shows he's sorry, it's not enough, right? I'm going to, see, that's why you did that. Nope, that's why you did that. It's like, a, no, you can't win, a, win an argument in the flesh. But Jesus knows all of this. And look at what verse 8 says. He says, now, do we have the mind of Christ? Brothers and sisters, do you have the mind of Christ? Yes. That's been given to you by the Spirit. You have the mind of Christ. That means you now can understand the difference between the flesh and the Spirit. You now are walking victoriously with that understanding, overcoming it in your own life and helping others to overcome it. That is the work of God. Amen. That is the work of God in the earth. People being set free from their own human wisdom. Now watch what it says. Verse 8. But Jesus knew their thoughts. But Jesus knew their thoughts. Now, I want to give you a living example. Okay? So I'm going to use you, you, Stacy. Jesus knew their thoughts. Do you know I can meet a complete stranger and I already know their thoughts? See, the problem with people, they're going to call me a heretic right now. They're going to say, this guy thinks he's Jesus. No, every believer who comes into the wisdom and understanding of the spirit and the flesh knows everybody's thoughts. See, the problem with the flesh is, well, how do you know what I'm thinking? You don't know if I said these words. I don't need to know your wording. You could speak Chinese. I don't even need to, uh, I don't even need to speak your language because I know the human heart. See, I know the human heart and I know God's heart. So I know your thoughts, even if I don't know exactly what you're saying. I know the motive behind everything you say. Somebody say amen. amen. People don't like this reality, but it's the truth. If I'm talking to you, and we're talking about money now. Let's talk about money, because people have an issue with money. Either they love money, or they use money. And there's a big difference between the two. Because you use what God gives you. You love what you don't have. You love what you don't have, right? You got $5,000, you're like, man, I wish I had 10. Amen. I could do more with 10. <laughs> so we're dealing with money now. Now I ask you, or I give you $100,000. I said, Stacy, you could do whatever you want with this, $100,000. I already know what she's thinking. If she's in the flesh, I know what she's thinking. If she's in the spirit, I know what she's thinking. Do I need to know what she's thinking? Do you see that? Do you see that's not confusing? But why do we make it complicated? Here's my prayer. You're my sister in the Lord. I believe God's going to keep you. I'm giving you $100,000. You can do whatever you want with it. And I walk away and I say, God, would you lead her by your spirit to do what it is that's necessary for the advancement of the kingdom, for the betterment of the kingdom? Would you lead her? I'm leaning into the spirit because I know if she's in the spirit, she's going to pray. If she's in the spirit, she's going to give because she's generous. If she's in the spirit, she's going to wait because she's going to wait on God to lead her. She's in the spirit. She's going to do all the things that the spirit does if she's in the spirit. If she's in the flesh, this is my prayer, right? I'm praying both ways. Keep her from the flesh because then she's going to be selfish. She's going to buy her own things. She's going to want stuff. She's going to even give to people and take credit for it because she wants to be seen to be good because this is what the flesh does. I don't need to know which one of those she's actually operating in to know the anatomy of the soul. We know the anatomy. We know the, the heart's intent. There's no one, no one that's different. Everybody's the same. 
Amen. Amen. Because they're operating in the flesh. So I know what the heart is saying. Jesus knowing their thoughts. Now I'm going to take it a step further because Jesus did actually know what they were actually thinking. And sometimes God has done that in my life. Sometimes I've actually told somebody what they were thinking by the inspiration of the Spirit, but it didn't really matter if that miracle took place because the purpose of that miracle was to point back to the mind of Christ, to point back to Jesus. It wasn't so I could be seen as a prophet because the heart disposition is there. So I want to encourage all of you, if you could see it in your own life, you could see it in anyone's life. If you know how to walk away from your flesh in your own life, then you know how to help someone point out what's going on in them. How do you think I can tell this to you? I mean, how do you think God has done it in my life? Why can I teach these things? Think about it. I, we're not going to take up another offering. So I'm not somehow waving this spiritual wand to get people to give more. I'm actually wanting you free. Like I'm, I'm, I'm preaching these things to you so you can then take it out into your real world environment and you can have victory in Christ so that hopefully somebody else will come to the Lord and we'll do this whole thing all over again because that's what we got to do, guys. As a Christian, it's your obligation to take the gospel to where you are. Mm -hmm. Watch this. But Jesus knew their thoughts. He said to the man with the deformed hand, come and stand in front of everyone. So the man came forward. Then Jesus said to his critics, I have a question for you. Does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath? Or is it the day for doing evil? Is this a day to save a life or to destroy it? And he took, he looked around one by one and said to them, said to the man. So he looked around at them one by one. Hey, you ever want to make eye contact with Jesus in a moment like that? Looking at them one by one. Because he's dealing with everybody. He's not just dealing with one person. He's not, look, 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 right there. Those two, you, look at each other. Two of you right there. Yeah, the sisters or the, yeah. Okay. Y'all, y'all ain't dealing with each other. You, you, now look at me, because I'm involved in this too. Now look across the room. You guys are all involved in this work with God. Jesus is looking at everybody. All of us. Like, like Let's make eye contact with him in this letter, because he's looking at us, and then he says, look, to the deformed man, come and stand in front of everyone. So the man came forward, then Jesus said to his critics, I have a question for you. So he's asking us, does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath? He's saying, do you have to work to get this? Or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save a life or to destroy it? And then he looks at all of them and he says, hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand and he restored it. At this, the enemies of Jesus were wild with rage and began to discuss what to do with him. You have the mind of Christ. That's who Christ was. He understood the hostility of the flesh. Church, I'm about to help you. You came in today. You want the truth, right? You didn't come here just to get something else. You came here to get something that you're going to live out every day. You came here to get a teaching, an empowerment that's going to help you in your workplace, in your home, in your life. Amen? Amen. So he says in front of everybody, be healed. Does the work. You have the mind of Christ. He knew who his critics were. If he knew what their thoughts were, then he knew what their thoughts would be. He knew that doing this was going to anger them. And he did it anyway. He knew that working on the Sabbath was going to anger them. All right, you ready? Because, I mean, I might get a report that 10 people lost their job this week. Your job says, don't preach the gospel here. Are you going to do it anyway? Some of us would reason right now. See, that's what, that's what happens when the truth comes. You still have to be led by the Spirit. God is going to truly lead you, but you cannot disregard it as though God would not ask that of you. But your human reasoning already, when that happens, the default mechanism in the human reason is this guy is crazy. God, God, you know what? There's a way to share the gospel on my lunch break. You're, You're making that up. You're not seeking God for that answer. 
You're giving God that answer. I'm telling you, will you? Will you preach anyway? Now, here's the other side of it. Yeah, I'll preach no matter what. You might be a very destructive person for the wrong reason because it's about you preaching and not the gospel. So what I'm not saying is don't lean on the flesh that's trying to make yourself right by the work that you do or don't do, see? But lean on God because what the Spirit says, yeah, if God's leading me to do this, I'm doing it. Yes, amen. Amen? amen. Can, can, you, can you stand with that right now? Can you stand with that? Because I'm, I'm going to just give you some scriptural examples. Daniel was praying every day. If you know the story, then you know what I'm talking about. But you, you can look up the story on Daniel. He was praying every day. His constituents, the people that he was working with, they plotted by going to the king and having him sign a decree to say you couldn't pray for a whole month. What did Daniel do? He prayed anyway. He prayed anyway. And what happened? He got thrown into a lion's den. You might lose your job over this. But I would, I would rather have unity with Christ and a job loss than division from him and kept my job. And this is what ends up happening. You're going to devote yourself. You're going to say, you know what? I think what Pastor Tony said is real and I feel the conviction of it. You know what? I'm preaching Jesus, dang it. I'm going to work and I'm on lunch break and I'm, I'm going to tell them about Jesus. And your boss calls you and says, you know what? You've been doing such a great job. I'm going to give you a, a raise. Matter of fact, I'm going to give you a whole nother position. You've been doing great. Thank you for abiding by all the rules. Thank you for everything. And you get a blessing. Are you still going to do it? See, God, that will happen. That will happen. The world, knowing that in the spirit realm, there are spiritual rulers. There's God and then there's darkness. And they hear the conversation that's happening right now to help free God's people so they can actually walk in victory. And they're already plotting of ways to discourage it. That's real. This isn't, this isn't some fairy tale thing. This is really happening. And I'm giving you something that's real. Amen? You need to receive it fully because your, your, your human reasoning can't. And I'm just asking God, okay, help us. Go real quick to Matthew 9. Uh, people come in. Uh, I, I literally, I, I asked uh, a couple people to pray for me because it's like when I give these words, I have this little nagging voice and I know it's not God. But it's this little demonic spirit that just keeps saying, they don't know what you're saying. They don't know what you're saying. They don't know what you're saying. They don't get what you're saying. Who are you talking about? Who's they? You know what I mean? I'm like, shut up. I know where that comes from, and it's not God. But it's there. You ever have a nagging voice? Keep trying to nag you? Yeah, I get them too. And guess what I'm going to do in the face of it? Preach it. Teach it. Live it. I'm going to shame that voice because it's, that's all you can do when you live out in the spirit is shame it. Amen. I'm just sharing with you transparency, guys. Some people think I'm too transparent. I don't think they're transparent enough. Jesus didn't hold back what he thought. Jesus didn't hold back what he thought. This whole thing was God breathed. Amen. So when they wrote and said Jesus knew their thoughts, he wanted you to know that he knew what people were thinking. We're getting it right now. Look at Matthew 9. Another example of this. Verse 1. Jesus climbed into a boat and went back across the lake to his own town. Some people brought to him a paralyzed man on a mat. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, Be encouraged, my child. Your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of religious law said to themselves, That's blasphemy. Does he think he's God? Pause. Pause. Have you ever said something to yourself about God? No? You never had a thought about God that was kind of against God, but you, you just had it in your own head, though? Yeah. Yeah. Look, I wonder if God's real. But you're a believer. Have anybody here? Come on, let's be transparent. Let's help the other people who might be struggling. If yeah. you, as a believer, have questioned if God is real, raise your hand. Amen. Oh, so it happens. Your thoughts, but it's in you. It's inside of you, right? You're like, I'm not going to ever tell nobody that, though. I'm, I'm a believer. I want everyone to believe that I believe. So I'm going to give them that part, but inside of me, I'm kind of... Well, I, I, I hope this gives you some revelation. Verse 4, just, just say, Jesus, Jesus. 
knew what they were thinking. So Jesus knows. He saw you question that. I know, dropping bottles over here. We're like, oh my God, Jesus sees everything. <laughs> now, Jesus knew what, we, what they were thinking, so he asked them, why do you have such evil thoughts in your hearts? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sin. And Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat and go home. And the man jumped up and went home. Fear swept the, through the crowd as they saw this happen and they praised God for giving humans such authority. That's how, that's how diabolical your flesh is. Your flesh is so selfish, it just keeps inserting itself into everything. Look what God gave to us. Instead of saying, look how God is. Look who God is without us. They looked at the healing instead of the forgiveness. Do you see that? Like, like your flesh will always... Is this good? Huh? Is this good? Your flesh will always try to be like God. Your flesh will always try to be like God. Well, he healed a paralyzed man. We can too. We got all the science. We can, we can heal people too. But you know what you can't do? You can't forgive sins. That's why they couldn't relate to that. It wasn't like, oh, we forgive sins too. It knows we can heal too. He's given humans this authority to heal bodies. No, he's given Jesus the authority to forgive a soul. Amen. To do what we can't do. Isn't that powerful? Yes. Isn't that wonderful? Like all of us in here have been revived by Jesus through the forgiveness of our sins, guys. Like who cares if you can walk on water? I'm serious. Like I've heard so many stories and sermons and people be passionate that God wants you to have faith to step out of the boat. Walk on water. And everybody's rah rah We're like, yeah, I want to walk on water. Don't be like these people. They just want to tell a fig tree to die, a mountain to move. No, oh, I want people's sins to be forgiven. I want the mind of Christ. See, the mind of Christ is only concerned about forgiveness. Oh, oh Lord, God, help me. Help me, Lord. I don't care if I look crazy for this. This is the best thing to look crazy for. Just go real quick, Matthew 22. This is the best thing to look crazy for. And you all look crazy, by the way. I'm just saying. Just go to a football game. People look crazy, man. Getting all dressed up over things that don't matter. Go to a Raider game. They're dressing up in skull outfits, and they're all blasted. Like, yeah, you guys look crazy. But, but, but we, we, I'm not even wearing special clothes, but I'm shouting Jesus, and they look at me like I'm strange. I mean, if I start wearing face paint for Jesus and stuff, you could say I'm crazy. Okay? I, <laughs> no, we're not going to do that. But I'm just saying, we look nuts as people. We make ourselves look foolish. I don't care if I look crazy for God. And neither should you. Right? The Spirit of God is not ashamed of God. You're coming out of religion. The Lord's bringing you out of religion. You've been held down by religion. You have. That's why there's been so much condemnation. Condemnation comes because you're not living up to the standard and expectations of men. Jesus has forgiven you of all your sins. You need to hear that this morning. You know what? That's that's. I love it. How many times? How many times has God brought somebody into the church in the middle of a message that He gives, and He gives a living example of why? You know, if I say your sins are forgiven, it's not by my authority. That's, that's not me saying that. That's Jesus telling you he's forgiven you of all your sins. Mm -hmm. I was, when I was fellowshipping with, with Stacy earlier, I, the revelation came even stronger. It was like, wow, Jesus forgiving people of their sins, hear the word of the Lord, is not the totality of salvation. 
They have to believe in him who forgives sins. That brings about salvation. So Jesus actually died for the entire world's sins and has washed all of that away. And now there's only one sin that you can't be forgiven of. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And that blasphemy is not believing in Jesus Christ as the only way. So he can forgive you of your sins, but if you don't believe in him, you can still go to hell. He can do the full act of forgiveness and you reject him and it's enough to still go to hell. Jesus has forgiven you of all your sins. Say amen, brother, because you know it to be true. (laughs) And your salvation is based on this fact that you put your faith in him. The man being healed, the paralyzed man being healed, made everybody go, whoa, and it struck fear in their hearts. Someone being forgiven of sin, whoa, because they're not deserving of that. And God gave it to them anyway. That's what we rejoice over. The heart and the the mind of Jesus rejoices over that reality. So here's another example, Matthew 22, verse 15. You came here today to be washed again, brother. Yeah, condemnation. Condemnation. I pray it come completely off of you. Because you know what, man? You are gifted. God has given you many gifts. A gift of a gentle spirit. That's not, that is in in the eyes of the flesh, in the way of the world, they call it weakness. But humility is like Christ. Never be ashamed of that. And I don't care who you have in your family, that's the man's man. Okay? I don't care who it is in your family that throughout your life has always been that contrast and the enemy has come and tried to put you against that like you're not like that that's how you should be no that's a lie from the pit of hell you're you to be like christ he is, he is not a man's man he was he was nothing like man though he relates everything to man he was what we could not be he was humble god has granted you that some people have certain gifts and, and humility is a gift there is a humility that god has given you that you walk in there's a, a way that you think about yourself that's actually good. Now, I hope you can let me be used by the Holy Spirit because I, this is all God. This is not me. But there's a way that you think about yourself that's actually good. Some of us fall into the woe is me. But that's not, that's, sometimes that's actually attached to the real riches that you have when not thinking you're so important. Okay? You have that. You, you have that natural, like, I know that I'm not that important. But the enemy tries to use it to say, oh, you're not important at all. You see how the woe is me can come with that? Are you following me? No, but you know that you're not important, right? You know you're not an important person? Do you know that? That God is the one that's important? Okay, but do you know that importance isn't resting in the flesh? You're not really that important. I am really not that important. Do you get what I'm saying? Okay, you get what I'm saying. At first, he's like, hold on a second, brother. I got value. (laughs) But you get what I mean, though? If your brother's sitting next to you right here and you got a piece of bread, are you going to eat the whole thing knowing he's in need? You would always share it, right? You know, I've met homeless people like that. I've met homeless people that share even the little they have because they they can't take it all for themselves. You know, that's a gift. You have that gift. That's what I'm trying to say. You don't think of yourself so important that you're looking to the person starving next to you and going, fend for yourself. I got to I got to live. You're like, nah, we both. See? Is that true? true. You're not like that? (laughs) He's like, yeah, I'm definitely (laughs) like that. But you know why God's having me say this to you? So you don't know. (laughs) What are we talking about today? Huh? The mind of Christ. Christ. What are we talking about today? That's what he wants us to have. And he knows people. And he knows how they're wired and he knows how they're made and he knows how they're hard. You know, not all people are that way, Jamil. Some people keep it for themselves. Some people won't even share when they have an abundance. You know, Jesus gives his last. Jesus doesn't just make sure that he's good. He makes sure that you're good. He takes care of you. And God wants us to walk in that same way. So you know what the challenge is to you? And may God help you with this? Is to give up your whole piece of bread. And don't keep any for yourself. Because that's how far God wants to take you, Jamil. 
He wants to take you so far that you will actually lack that someone else would not. As a matter of fact, I even see a calling to help homeless people. I see a calling to help people who are less fortunate. I see a calling on you to actually take that cross up, to actually bear the weight of that cross, the weight of that cross, the weight of denying yourself that other people might live. And I'm not talking physically. How'd you get here? Yeah, how'd you get here? You brought them? How'd you bring them? No. <laughs> God knew we needed some type of laugh right there. It was like, in a car. <laughs> Thanks a lot, sister. How'd you guys meet? No, go ahead, Mike. How'd you guys meet? Where? Really? No, don't tell all that part. But you were talking to the, him and yeah, the girl. So that was it. And then just I told him, um, this is where we go. And, and so you wanted to come. So why'd you come today? He's like, bro, you put me on a spot. I may never come back. Why'd you come? You want to feel closer to God. People come out, come with a lot of different answers. Well, do you feel closer to God? You probably won't after this message. <laughs> because the feeling, though good, could come from the flesh. It could be, well, I want to get closer to God because I have needs. And God, yeah, he'll, he'll do all that just like he'll heal the, le the, the hand of the paralyzed man. Or he'll tell him to get up and walk. But the greatest need is the forgiveness of sins. So you came to here to feel closer to God and God allowed you to come here to show you just how close he is to you. Because it ain't because you walked into this room that you're closer to God. It's because God has marked you for the forgiveness of sins and the belief in Jesus Christ as his own. And he's reminding you of that. He's reminding you of that. He is now the, he is now the standard in your life. Not anyone else, no other man, Nothing else. Christ is truly the standard. So may God bless you. May he keep you. May he raise you up to be the man of God that, you, that he calls you to be. And may your desires begin to line up with what he desires for you. And may you actually learn what that means. Yes. Amen? Amen. And know you're not put on the spot before people. Because you've been in the eye of the Lord. He's the one that's been watching over you. Yes. Yeah, 22. 15 through 22. It's all right. 15 through 22. Then the Pharisees met together, we're almost done, to plot how to trap Jesus into saying something for which he could be arrested. They sent some of their disciples along with the supporters of Herod to meet with him. Teacher, they said, we know how honest you are. Man, the flesh will exploit the qualities of God, right? We know how honest you are. You teach the way of God truthfully. Guys, think about what they're saying. You are impartial and don't play favorites. Now tell us what you think about this. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Verse 18, this is the theme here, the mind of Christ. But Jesus knew their evil motives. Now see, in other scriptures, he said he knew what they were thinking. In this one, he knows their motives behind what they were saying. Jesus knew their evil motives. Look at yourself. Do you know your evil motives? Can I give you further insight, brother and sister? You want the mind of Christ, right? Then your flesh only has evil motives. It never has godly motives, ever. And your flesh wants to divide what belongs to God, which is to first separate your thoughts from God's thoughts. You ever meet that person who just wants you to agree with them? Like they will just want you to agree with them. They, their whole goal is just to get you to agree with them. So they're actually in opposition with the truth because they want their truth to be truth. And so they just want to gather for themselves people who will agree with them, right? That's the flesh. You're, that's your flesh. 
No, that's your mind. That's what your mind is under the governing of the flesh. It just wants to win the argument. And it will do everything to win that argument. You ever see anybody who's addicted to something? Video games, drinking, smoking. That's, isn't that what they're notorious for? Their mind just wants to find a way to justify to do it. Okay, those, those things I mentioned are just physical expressions, fruit of the root. The root is always the same. I don't care if you're addicted to food or if you're addicted to cocaine. Whatever you're addicted to, the root is the same. The flesh wants to win the argument, wants to just, that's not God. I don't care if you think, oh man, ooh, Lord, help me. See, the spirit of God is moving so strong. I don't care if you think you're called to the ministry. You can think you're called to the ministry from the flesh. Isn't that what Pharisees were? Oh, we're Pharisees. We're the teachers of the law. Yeah, you positioned yourself there all right. Yep. You're not giving God the glory for anything. You're taking all the glory for yourself. People want to position themselves because they're motivated by the flesh to do so. God is the one that, dis that positions you, and it's just what I told this man. God positions you so you can be generous. God positions you so you can give up your life. God positions you so you can lay your life down, so you can actually, other people can walk on you. I know, <laughs> my sister was like, oh, okay. I, we all feel that way. <laughs> We don't like to be walked on unless it's a deep tissue massage. We're like, we're cool. Walk on my back all you want. But no. Church, I know this is hard sometimes to sit in. I know this gets, this, this gets like, it's an exercise, right? It's spiritual exercise. It's like, you came in to lift a 10-pound dumbbell, and I'm saying, here's a 50. You're like, I don't think I'm ready for that. Well, we'll work up to it. But when you walk into the gym, you still see the 50s are there, right? They're not, they're not hiding anywhere. It's not a gym full of 10-pound dumbbells. There's deeper truths that are out in the open for all of us to have, and I know it's hard. I know it's like, I don't want to believe this about myself. You need to believe it about yourself because that's who you are without God. You also need to believe who you are in God, which is the one that's free from all of that. You're no longer living according to your own standard in your own way. Amen. Amen? Amen? Is this hard? What's your name? Yeah, you. Yeah, she, she's thinking. She's, is it hard to understand? Be honest. Amen. Sister, thank you for your honesty. Thank you for your honesty. Because it is hard to understand. This is why we need God to do it. This is why we need the Spirit of God to help us understand. So the thing I would say to you is this. I wouldn't tell you to read more to pray more, to worship more, I tell you one thing. Ask God mm -hmm. to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Yes. Amen. And then everything else will come. Amen. Yes, amen. Amen. Ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. And then everything else comes. Yes. And anybody who's ever once been in that spot where you didn't understand, I got other people in here, I was once one of them. Why do you understand now? Because of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. It's the only reason why I can preach how I'm preaching in this crazy country we're in. And there be people who actually go, that is setting me free. That's the only way. Because there's so many other messages being preached and it's not this one. It's, it's not. Again, I'll close with this. The flesh will say, <laughs> the flesh, man, whoo, it is Relentless. But it'll be like, oh, so you're saying you guys are the only church that has the truth, huh? And you're the only pastor that, yeah, that's what the flesh will say. No, that's not what I'm saying. That's what your flesh is telling you. What I'm saying is there's no one like God. There's only one God. There's only one Lord. There's only one Holy Spirit. There's only one way, one truth, and one body of Christ. And we're a part of it. That's what I'm saying. And I will not be ashamed of it. I won't be ashamed of it. And you guys understand, pray for me, pray for us, pray for this church, pray for the leaders, because man, it, there are people trying to trap us in stuff. There are people trying to trap us in stuff. Literally, oh, so well, what would you do if this was the situation? It's like, I know your evil motives. 
I know why you're asking. I just had somebody do that to me. I'm like, I know why you're asking me that question. You're literally trying to ensnare me. People of God don't do that. We don't sneak around and try to do that. We don't try to ensnare each other. The Spirit of God, we walk through all things for the sake of freedom. We, we endure all things for the sake of freedom. Amen? Amen? And I don't care how ugly it gets. We will bear that with you for the sake of freedom. Amen. So may God help us all. We have the mind of Christ. We know the thoughts that God allows us to, to know. He's growing in all of us. Right? It is a process. It's def- no, ain't nobody arrived. Amen? Amen? Like even, man, you came here today on this message. Boy, if God don't know you, man, you think too much. You're a thinker, bro. Like literally, I listen, I can relate because sometimes, especially in my past, when, when I had all kinds of questions about God and stuff, I try to seek it out through so many other things. I was like, I'm going to look up all kinds of stuff. I'm just going to figure this out. And then you get something and it just sits on you. Like you're the type of person that cannot let something go. As a matter of fact, yes, unforgiveness is a real issue. You're a person that can't, you have struggles with letting it go, okay? But there's a gift in that. There's a gift in that because for every gift that God gives, it gets perverted by the flesh. There's a gift of holding on to something and not letting it go. I pray that it be Jesus. I pray that it be your faith, that that what you cling to that, you're like, I am not letting go. But when it comes to bitterness and anger and all that stuff, I pray you let all that go. I pray God help you with that. But God knew that you would be a thinker and God knew that you would overthink. Knew that it would absorb you to the point where like literally you're restless. There's times your mind cannot shut off. You have a hard time going to sleep because your mind cannot shut off. There, not everybody's like that. There's some people who are like, I'm out, and they're out. I think I'm kind of like that. Am I like that? I would say I'm like that. Am I like that, church? Okay, okay. I'd say I'm like that. But you're not. You're not. When something happens, especially when it comes to your, you know, especially when it comes to your family, you know what I mean? You have a hard time shutting that off. You go to sleep with it. You wake up with it. It's throughout your day. But there's a gift to that, okay? The, the, the flesh is trying to pervert that. But the Spirit of God wants to use that because when that yes, turns into intercessory prayer, yes. when that turns into a yes. focus on Jesus yes. coming yes. forth, like when that, that tenacity comes into the, into the Lord, it's effective. It's effective. But the flesh wants to pervert that. So I hope that God gives you understanding that he brought you in on this message today for that word right there. Because, and he's using me to tell you who you are, just like he's done, I don't even know how many times we've been in church. And I pray he doesn't stop because it's not for any man to be seen. It's for the glory of God. But he's doing that so that way you would receive the message because you because there's the struggle was there. As you sat through this message, the struggle of like, is this real? And now God's saying it's real. The paralyzed hand has just came and bit, was made whole. He just told you who you were through a complete stranger. And yes, you're going to tell her, did you tell him about me and all this other stuff? No. <laughs> The Lord knows you because the Lord created you and, and, he, and he just wants you to receive this word. You don't need to understand everything, but you do need to receive the word, if that makes sense. So anyways, okay, I have other notes, but I'm not going to read them. Is this good? Yeah, it's really good. Father, we thank you for your word. Um, even though I feel there's still parts of it undone, Lord, I pray you just, you bring the completion in the heart of every person here. I also pray for people who are struggling right now that are still entangled with that human reasoning that, um, that they would not be given over to it. Help them to stay in unity. Help them to stay in fellowship. If, if they're called to come here to this body, help them to get to men's, to get to women's, to get to Friday night, to get here on Sunday mornings. Help them to be consistent in their walk with you, Father God. And help us as a church to help them to aid them, to pray with them, to comfort them, to correct them, to bring anything that needs to be brought so they can walk in the fullness of what you have for them and for us. Lord, we ask for your hand to be upon our lives. And we thank you, Lord, for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you. I'm going to Zamora's. No, I'm not.